I'm so excited today uh, to do the third message in this incredible series called Fellowship. Someone say fellowship. fellowship. Um, <clears throat> today is Father's Day, and, and I was thinking about um, you know, how to kind of go about talking about uh, fellowship. And so the title of today's message is God's New World. Someone say God's God. New World. I don't know if you know this, but we are all living in God's world <laughs> because he is God. And, um, and so I, I want to open today with a story about my father that, that uh, always kind of struck with me. When I was in high school, uh, I had a Volvo, and um, as Callie, my fiance, calls it a Volva, which I always get super annoyed at because I'm Swedish. <laughs> and it was a Volvo, and it was this really, really great car, and and uh, I remember one time I was 17 years of age and I was driving to the donut shop because when I grew up, my, the thing I used to do with my grandmother was uh, we would usually gossip over donuts. Whoever had, you've had like a thing you did with your grandmother and that was like my grandmother thing and my grandmother's here today and she's laughing at me because that's kind of what we did. We would sit around most of our time together and we would eat donuts and then gossip about family members who have ever done that before. Um, and so I, I like donuts. And so I went to the donut shop. There was one donut place by my house. And so I, I went there and I drove there by myself. And, and I had work in like uh, 45 minutes. So I said, hey, I'm going to go and, you know, enjoy myself. And, and when I was there, I, my car started going kind of crazy. It started rattling and all the lights were blinking. And it, it was right when I was like pulling into this donut shop. And so I remember when I, I parked the car and I got out of the car and all this fluid from the car was everywhere. It was like flowing across the parking lot. And if anyone knows me, I, that would like embarrass the heck out of me. So I'm there and I'm literally just standing in this Volvo fluid <laughs> that is just all over this parking lot. And I, I called my father and I said, Dad, you know, do we have AAA, like tow truck? You know, I'm not at that time, I'm, I'm not like the fix-it guy, right? And, it, and so my dad says, okay, I'll be there in five minutes, because it was right by the house. And so he came, and I never forget this. Uh, he came and I said, hey, like, where's the tow truck? What time are they going to be there? You know, I got to get to work, right? I'm thinking this way. And he opens, uh, and he opens his car, and he, and he takes out... A, uh, a, a radiator, because that's, that's what it was, and, and, and a toolbox. And I'm like, Dad, we're in a donut shop parking lot. What are you expecting me to do with this stinking radiator and these tools? And he said, he said we're going to fix your car. And at this point, I'm like, okay. So I remember that we popped the hood and, and he, took, he took all these tools out and he had a jack and he lifted the car. And I just remember this like this adorable like little Asian couple owned that donut shop and they came out and they were staring at us. It was like kind of intense and I was really embarrassed. And, and, so, and so I said to my dad, I go, so are you going to fix my car? He goes, no, 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 you're going to fix your car. I'm here to help you fix your car. I said, okay. <laughs> so he stood over my shoulder and he walked me through how to exchange the, the radiator. And it always stuck with me because, you know, I, I can, anyone who knows me knows I can be a little Orange County. Is that a fair assessment to my friends? I can be a little bit of an Orange County person. I'm just one of those people that like to go places and things work, right? Or I love when I go shopping and there's this shopper to help me. <laughs> like I hate stores with bad lighting. I hate stores where I can't find help. I just can't. I literally can't do it. I don't know what it was. God loves me, saved, sanctified, and delivered. As my Uncle Tim said this years ago, he says that God doesn't kill your ego. He sanctifies it. That's kind of me, right? And, and so I, I just wasn't going to do all any of this. So I remember that over 30 minutes, he showed me how to put my car together, and, and it worked. I was super surprised I was able to do it. And he turned to me and said, uh, you know, how dads do. He said, you know, sometimes in life, you don't need a tow truck. 
You can just fix it on your own if you know what to do. And I love that because it, it always stuck with me because a, a, a couple things and why I brought that up today is because when we say that God is our Heavenly Father, it means something. Because fathers play a role. They, fathers play a role. And I believe that the, the, the role that a father plays is they encourage courage. I think that's the primary role of the father. I've thought about this a lot, is that what fathers do is they encourage you to act courageously in the midst of tough seasons. That's what they do. One of my favorite uh, shows that I like to watch is MasterChef Junior. And if anyone, any Gordon Ramsay fans knows about this. And they take all these kids, the 8 to 12 years old, and they, they put them essentially in a pressure cooker. And you kind of feel, you're amazed at what these kids can do and what they can cook. But you also feel terrified and sad that a 9-year-old is crying because he cooked his steak, you know, well done. And, and one of the things I love about that show is that you will see these kids, that they will get overwhelmed because they're kids. And then Gordon always does the same thing. He always gets to their level. He always goes down to where they are, and he says, I hear you. This is a tough thing. I get it. But what we're not going to do is we're not going to fall apart. That's not who we are. You're a chef. You can do it. And then he encourages the kids to be courageous, and he says, you have it in you. You can make this. You can get back up. You, you can do this again. And so when we say that God is our father, what we are saying is that he fathers us. And so God is the source of our courage. He takes us where we are and he sees us for who we could be because he made us. Amen. He made you. He knows every hair on your head, every thought you can ever have, your absolute limit, how courageous you can be, how incredible you can be. He knows all of that because he puts you together. And what's interesting is that when you say yes to Jesus and you become a Christian and God becomes your heavenly father, something miraculous happens. He doesn't just leave you. When a father shows up, the will of the father happens. Does that make sense? When God shows up, and why this relates to fellowship is when we say that we fellowship with God, what we're saying is that God has chosen to make his home in us. So God created us. He breathed life into us. He gave us our gifts and our talents. And then he said, I am your heavenly father and I am going to dwell in you. I am going to fill you with my presence. I am going to fill you with my strength. I am going to fill you with my goodness and my glory. And you are going to be ground zero for everything I want to do in your family. You are going to be ground zero for everything I'm going to do in your Belinda. You are going to be ground zero for everything I'm going to do in this world. And so when we say that God is our heavenly father and we say that we fellowship with the father... What we are saying is that the Father has come down to us in Jesus, and he has made his home in us. And when he is present, things operate a little differently. Yeah. Amen? Let's clap for that. It's an amazing thing to get that revelation. You know, one of my favorite verses is John 3, 6, 16, and it's, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, he gave his only son, that everyone who believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but he sent his son into the world to save the world. And so what is interesting about God is that God is in the business of saving things. We talked about this a couple weeks ago when we talked about that when God created the world, he created it as a home for himself. That's Genesis 1 and 2. It's a temple story. God, out of love, creates this incredible creation and fills it with people and gives humanity all these gifts and talents. And then he gives them a responsibility. He gives them purpose and agency that they can be stewards and they can add value and that they could be in the world and multiply and create great things. And he says that he built all of that. And then on the seventh day, he rests. He fills his creation with his presence. He, as a good father, is not absent 
like so many of us have experienced absent fathers. But when it comes to our Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father is not far away. He is here. He is making his home in you. He is in your life. He wants you to live with his strength. He wants you to see the world through his eyes. He wants you to reach the potential he has given you. And he has sent Jesus to be next to you so that you might do the things he is calling you to do. That's the beautiful thing about God is that he doesn't just say something over you and then leave. I feel like that's how we often feel in life. Who's felt that way? It's like you, we go to church and maybe someone gave us a word or maybe we read something about in Scripture. We, we read that we are made in God's image. But then it's like we're back to life in the world by our own purpose. And we're trying to fight the good fight with our own strength. Who has felt that way? And, and what the Bible says is the exact opposite. Is that The Bible says that when God called you, and he made you, and he decided to love you, he is not doing those things from afar. He is doing those things closely. That's what fellowship is. When you have fellowship with someone, it's not just a relationship. It's like being in a family. I told, I told this story last week. It's like, you know, the family is amazing, but sometimes family can bug the heck out of you because they are in all your stuff at all times. Who has had moments where it's like, does everyone need to be opinionated about everything that I do at all times? <laughs> well, why is that? Because families are connected. Families are involved in each other's lives on a day-to-day -day basis. So when we say that we live in fellowship with God, we're not saying that we have a relationship with God like an out-of-state friend. I feel like that's how often it feels like. It's like God's over there. He lives in Arkansas, right? If I need something, I'd call him. i send him a fax, maybe an email, right? I hope he got it. I think he did. I heard some person tell me that they got a, a word that he had heard what I was talking about. But, like, we kind of live feeling as if he's not around. But when we read the Scripture, the opposite is true. We get this image of a God who is very present. Luke 19, 9, I, I love this. This is Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house. I love that. Jesus comes as God to a house and knocks on their door and then tells them, salvation, the redeemer, the healer, the restorer, the one who made you is here at your door. And I'm going to make my home in you and I am going to be here with you so that as you walk out your purpose, as you express your gifts, as you have to go through seasons of desert, I am not only with you, I'm here to make sure that what heaven said happens in your life. Amen? Let's give a clap for that. And so a couple of things happen, I believe, when we fellowship with God and when we make fellowship a priority and when we begin to see this dynamic that God created us, he put things inside of us, but he is making his home in us. He does it individually and corporately. That's the church. You know, the church is not a building. It's a people. It's a family. The word church comes from the Greek word ecclesia, which literally just means a people called together. For the first 300 years of church history, Christians were not allowed to own buildings because it was illegal for them to gather. It was an illegal religion. And so almost all of the early church, they didn't think of church conceptually as a building with stage and lighting and social media campaigns. That wasn't the church. And so that's the thing about church is that you can take everything away but if you have a people, that's the house. That is the temple. We have become the place in which God dwells. And so when we come together and we say that two or more are gathered in my name, it doesn't just mean that God hears us. It's way more than that. When two or three of members of Jesus' family come together, Jesus is present. He is there. 
His goodness is there. His strength is there. His presence is there. His love is there. And I love that message because you could take everything away that you have, every resource, every asset. There could be a war. There could be a a, a financial crisis. You could take everything away. But if you have two or more members of Jesus' family together, he doesn't just say, I hear you. He says, I'm with you. I'm right there. I'm in your life. I'm making my home in you. You are ground zero for what I want to see in the world. You know, it's a beautiful thing when we come to know God because, you know, in, in this, if I can get nerdy for a, a, just a second, <laughs> but the beautiful thing about a church is that the church models what God wants to see in the world. That's what it is, this, just very plainly. You read Genesis 1 and 2 and you read Jesus and you, you read that we're made in God's image and, and creation is this incredible place and, and sure it's been broken and we've all gone through sin and we've all dealt with things. But then we read that God is our savior and that he sends Jesus and Jesus is the king and he, he is saving. And so the thing about kings that save is they don't throw things away. They take things and they redeem them and they restore them and they bring them back to life. And so when we say that Jesus is our Savior, what we are saying is that He is saving us. He has come to our house. He has knocked on our door. And He is saying, I am going to redeem. I'm going to renew your life. I'm going to heal what's broken. I'm going to fill your house with so much love that love will not just be a feeling. Love will be your destiny. Love will be the end of your story. That's one of the things that I love about love is that when, when we as Christians, when we say that God loves us, we often think about it in the way that we just, everyone says it, right? When we say, like, I love you, often it's a feeling, right? And, and I, I think of, like, I think of, for some reason, I always think of college kids that are in love, right? And I always think of, what's that John Cusack movie where he's, like, holding the big speaker outside the window? <laughs> what movie is that? Anyway, uh, Breakfast, Breakfast Club. Club. No. no, I don't think so. They say anything, excuse me. And so, but we often think of love as a feeling, but for Christians, we think of love in terms of divine love. Our definition of love comes from the God who loved us. Does that make sense? And so we say, okay, we are loved by God. Okay, what does that mean? So then we look at Jesus and we say, how does he love us? And we see three things. We see that God created us. That is an act of love. Because he knew your future self and believed that you were worth creating. That's a beautiful thing. When God made you, he believed you were worth being made. Because he saw the world, and then he saw the world with you in it, and he felt that the world would be better with you in it. And so when God made you, he gave you a promise over your life. And so anybody who has told you you weren't worth it, anybody who didn't see your gifts, anybody who told you and made you feel small, they are lying. And they are not God. Because when God saw the world, when he created the world, And then he saw an image of the world with you in it or with you not being in it. He chose to put you in it because he has put something inside of you. And that is an act of love. And so that's number one. The the second thing is that God loves you so much that he has seen you in your brokenness. Every one of us has gone through moments of true brokenness where we forgot where we were. We forgot who we were. We forgot what we could do. Life kicked us outside the head. We were left, as my Uncle Tim likes to say, a discounted version of ourselves, which I absolutely love because that's how we often feel. And so what does God do about it? He sends his son, Jesus, to knock on your door to say that the Savior is here. I love you so much. 
I didn't just create you and give you the gift of life, but I am here to help you. I am here to remind you. I am here to empower you. That's what fathers do. I am here as your heavenly father to bring out the best in you. And the final piece of this love is, and, and, and this is, I think, so amazing, is that when, when Jesus comes to earth and we said yes to Jesus and the resurrection happens, I like to say it like this. It's kind of like a spoiler alert ending of the story. Like, I'm one of those people that when I like watching movies, sometimes I will watch the spoil. I will read the spoilers. <laughs> and so when, when we see the resurrection of Jesus, what is actually happening is that we're actually seeing the end of our story. Because what we see in the resurrection of Jesus is that Jesus defeats the forces of darkness in the world. He comes against all the things that break us. And he overcomes it. And so when he overcomes it, what then that's communicated to us is that when we are in God, that's what will happen to us. We will not experience final death. Sin will not get the best of your life. Your brokenness will not define you. You will not be alone in the end. For I will be with you. I will empower you. I will raise you. That's Jesus. And so when we say that God loves us, it's way bigger than he just feels great about us. He is saying, I have made you, I have come down from heaven to you, and I await you. And so whatever happens between now and then, you can count on me being with you and for you and ahead of you. If that doesn't get you excited... And so when we come together and fellowship, we're doing a couple things. The first thing that we're doing is that we are experiencing the absolute love of God. When we come together as a church, just like we do every Sunday, what we are doing is that God is saying that I am building this new family, which is the church, the congregation family. Jesus is the head of this church. He's the head of the global church. It's not like we all came together and decided to come up with a concept called church This is not some like thing that humans created. This is this idea that Jesus died for our sins. He is redeeming the world. He has an intention for the world. And so what he is doing is he is bringing his people together. He is bringing his people into one space to become a family in which he can fellowship in. And he is doing that for a purpose. My mom preaches this amazing message. It's one of my favorite messages ever. It's on reconciliation. And she talks about how that we are reconciled to be reconcilers. And it comes from 2 Corinthians 5, 18. It says, all this is from God. This is Paul. Who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to Christ in himself. Not counting men's trespasses against him. He has committed to the use of the message of reconciliation. Pastor Stefan, what are you trying to tell me? I'm trying to tell you that when Jesus saved your life, he saved you for a reason. He didn't just save you so you can be someone who watches life go by. He saved you for a purpose. He didn't save you just from the world. I feel like that's the way we often think about it, that Jesus saves us from the world. But Jesus saves his people for the world. He saved you because he loves you. And we learned what does love mean. Love means he loved you enough to put you in the world. So if that's true, when we say that we are saved, Jesus doesn't just save us from our sins. What he does is he forgives us He purchases our life back from darkness. He reveals the truth of who you are. He empowers you with his spirit and gives you divine gifts. And then he asks you to be a partner with him 
to be an agent of his purpose in your family, in your church, and in the world. And why that's so beautiful is because when we talk about this idea of fellowship, something amazing happens when we fellowship. It's like a wellspring. It's like a family. When a family gets together and has a potluck or a Christmas party, love comes out of that, right? Beauty comes out of that. Grace comes out of that. Mercy comes out of that. Families that are organized in in a great way, when they come together and they open up their homes and and they start loving each other, amazing things happen. And a couple of things happen. One is that, and for Christians, when we come together and come into a church environment and we partner with each other, what happens is that what happens in heaven happens here. God makes his home in us. And so he... Jesus is the head of the church, and he came and announced the kingdom of God. He announced that what happens in heaven is going to happen on earth. And so what we believe is that when we come together, and we worship together, and we say, God, fill our lives, and we say, God, open us up, what happens is the church becomes the model for what God wants to do in the world. That goodness becomes our goodness. We start treating each other differently. We start serving each other. That generosity, the generosity that God has given us, we start being generous with each other. We start giving in the offerings, right? We start giving towards projects. We start giving towards each other. But what are we doing? We're modeling the goodness of God. We're modeling our Heavenly Father. We're, we're taking on the attributes of our Heavenly Father because we live in God's new world. That is the church. The church is the place on earth where what God wants to happen has begun to happen. And so when we say that we are made in God's image, when we say that we are citizens of heaven, what we are actually saying is we are saying that I am a person of God. When I said yes to Jesus, I said yes to being a member of his family. I said yes to him dwelling in my life, and I said yes to being a purpose, to being an agent for his purpose in the world. I want to see what my father wants to see happen. I want to use the gifts and talents God has given me to begin to see what my father sees happen, because I'm a member of his family, and he is my father, and he has empowered me, and so now I am empowered And I am full of courage. And I am able to do exceedingly and above all that I can imagine. Why? Because Jesus is in you. Worship team, please come up. If everyone could stand with me this morning. Let's give God some praise. Um. I'm going to have the worship team pray, and, uh, and I'm also going to have uh, Joseph come and, and, and close the service. Uh, who, f- who learned something this morning? Yeah. You know, I think that, if you guys can come out, I think that one of the things that God has given us as people of faith, and, and, and what I wanted to explain today just is God has given us such an opportunity to be a light to the world. Every person in this room has gifts and talents. Every one of you was made in God's image. You might not feel like that all the time. You might have moments where you self-doubt. You might have moments where you're human. That's okay, because we are human. But the beautiful thing about being a Christian is that when we have our human moments, we can use God's strength when we don't have strength. We can say, God, I don't have it all figured out. I don't know what to do in this situation. I don't really know what to be, or I don't know if I have it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use your faith. I'm going to do it by faith. I'm going to step forward courageously. What? And I have a feeling that if I ask every person in this room, you have something in your life that scares you, that you are trying to make it through. And what God is saying 
is that I am your heavenly Father. Have courage. I am with you. You are stronger than you think you are. And if you can take this on, and if you could be courageous, and if you could rise to the occasion in your life, I will be waiting for you on the other side. So have no fear, for I love you. Rest in my love. Hello, it's Tim Story. I hope you enjoyed the service. If so, subscribe. If not, still subscribe. It's good. <laughs>